I like to use the analogy of people who go skydiving. I'm sure flying to the top of that building or whatever you're flying up to and putting on the harness. And even the second you jump feels terrifying. But once you're free falling and you hit the ground, you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe I just did that. Welcome to The Art of Speaking Up, a podcast that empowers professional women to rise. I'm your host, Jessica Guzik, and in this show, I take you undercover into the stories and lessons that I learned, sometimes the hard way, throughout my career. I also talk with working women, leaders, and coaches to show you that no matter what your struggle is and no matter what your career goals are, you already have all the talent that you need to succeed. Welcome to the show. Thank you for tuning in. I cannot believe that we are getting towards the end of the year. Time has been flying by, but I am excited to start to round out this year's episodes with a chat that I had with a guest named Nikki. She does coaching and she helps women with their resumes and with the job search process. And she is a working woman herself. And I had so much fun talking with her. She has a very infectious, positive energy that really rubbed off on me in the conversation. And I got to ask her about some of my favorite topics. So you're going to hear us talk about things like job searching and salary negotiation, but not just the tactics. We do talk about the tactics, and this is an episode filled with tips and information, so I think that'll help if you're thinking about job searching or you're wanting to improve your resume. But we also talk about the fear, and we also talk about why these processes can be scary, why salary negotiation can be scary, why job searching can be discouraging and difficult at times. And Nikki talks a lot about leaving our comfort zones and what that could look like and why it's important. She's someone who has spent a lot of time building her skills in public speaking, and it was really fun to ask her some questions about that and get her thoughts on how people can be effective speakers and present themselves effectively, even if they aren't initially super comfortable speaking to groups and even if they struggle at first. If you've been listening to the show, you know that I love giving advice no matter what your starting point is. So if you're having troubles finding your voice, if you're having troubles presenting yourself or showing up in a way where you feel strong and confident, I believe that we can always grow and evolve, even if we do so in little steps. And this conversation is full of tidbits of information that I think will help you do that. I am so excited for you to meet Nikki, hear more about what she does, and hear some of her advice. And with that, let's get to the conversation and enjoy. So I'm Nikki. I am a professional career strategist, and I'm also a college professor, and I'm still in my nine to five, so I'm in the insurance tech industry. So a little bit of everything. I love to ask all of my guests to share what it is they're working on right now in terms of personal growth or professional development. So right now, one of the biggest things that I'm focusing on is furthering my professional development in a work format. So this week, I finished ProSci Change Management Certification, so to improve my change management skills. And then I utilize Udemy, um, it's U-D-E-M-Y, all the time for personal and professional development. They have the most amazing classes, I and mean, they're always at a really good price. Oh, cool. Do you have any specific ones that you've loved or just like a topic or section if someone's like, oh, I want to do that, where should I go? Yes. So my favorite so far has been the project management course, solely because whether you're working or at home, project management is critical to really every part of your life. Totally. Okay, cool. That's awesome. I will put a link to Udemy in the show notes. Thank you for sharing that. People usually just share what they're working on, but you shared an actual resource, which is super helpful. And I want to talk a little bit about some of your career learnings and some of your experiences and also the things that you've experienced helping other people in their careers. The first thing I wanted to get your thoughts on is just what has been challenging for you personally in the nine to five world and what have you learned through that? So initially what was really hard for me was vocalizing the things that I want. It took a long time for me to just be comfortable. Hey, I need this. So at the beginning, I'm sitting at my desk and I'm like, I need more work. 
a lot of people think having downtime is great, but not all the time because I'm coming for a purpose. So I learned that sometimes I just have to go to my boss and say, hey, I feel like I'm being underutilized. What can we do about it? So I think that's 100% what I've been taught a lot over the past four and a half years that I've been out of school and working. Was there anything that helped you work up the courage? Because I know sometimes people know they should ask for something or know that they should say something, but they're feeling afraid to say it. Is there anything that helped you or anything you would advise to someone who is a little bit afraid to vocalize their needs? Absolutely. So I don't know if you've heard of it. Have you ever heard of Toastmasters? Yes. So Toastmasters 100% helped me be comfortable going to upper management and saying the things I need and laying out my thoughts in a clear manner. I am a huge Toastmasters advocate, shameless plug, and it's great. And I think if you're trying to get comfortable talking to people or talking about things that make you a little nervous, that's the way to go. That's really good advice. I don't know if your Toastmasters chapter has been this way, but the one that I've been in, everyone's really welcoming too. They're very nice. It can seem like a scary thing to do, but it's not as scary as one might think it is. No, it's not. So I've been in Toastmasters almost five years, and I'm currently a president and an area director, which means I have four clubs under me that I have to make sure that they're going on the right path. And I have yet to go to a club that wasn't extremely open and welcoming every single time. I want to throw in a Toastmasters question for you now that we're on this thread, because if you've been doing it for five years, that means you've seen a lot of speakers and a whole host of styles. Can you talk a little bit about how someone can be effective without necessarily being the boldest, like how people can be effective or persuasive in unexpected ways? Because I think that might be really helpful for someone listening. Yeah. So I've seen some of the shyest people get on stage and flourish and not by being loud and not by being bright and bold, but because they have good storyline, because they have the passion behind it. One of the biggest things is when you're trying to talk about things, talking about the things that you want to talk about helps. And it also prepares you in those times you have to talk about things you don't want to talk about. So if you are meeting somebody in the elevator, Toastmasters is the perfect place where you'll learn how to give that 30 second pitch on who I am, what I do. And it's nice to meet you. It's so true. It's almost like muscle memory when you're forced to speak in that way, even though sometimes it can be uncomfortable doing some of the exercises in Toastmasters. I know I was like, oh my gosh, this is really scary. But then you get into these other situations and it really does feel easier. That's been my experience. Mm -hmm. Every single time. It's gotten easier and then they've switched the program around quite a bit. And there's a huge leadership centered focus now for it was just public speaking. And you're forced to get out of your comfort zones. My most recent speech, I had to do a panel interview on leadership and ask people these questions. And I never conducted a panel before. So it makes you step outside of that little box that you're afraid of leaving. Oh, I love that. And I think it's also so helpful to do things outside of our jobs. Like to, I think it enhances our leadership so much when we pour ourselves into something completely different. And it can actually like really reignite your excitement for the other work you do when you jump into something new like that. That's very true. I tell people all the time. I love that. That's such a good recommendation. I love these actionable tips. I know there are a lot of people that really like these. So I'm so glad that you shared them. And I want to talk a little bit about progressing in someone's career, because that is something that you support people in doing in different ways. And I want to specifically ask you about your experience seeing people who maybe want to make change and want to push themselves forward or change something about their current career situation, but they have thought patterns or inner stories or fears that are holding themselves back. Can you share your experience of that, what you've seen, what you've observed? Yeah. So here's the thing. What happens to so many people is they're like, well, I just have to do this one until the next one comes along. And that mindset Make sure you do your current job at a lower quality. When you decide, okay, I want to do something different, what do you want to do different? And not just a, I want a higher paying job. What type of job do you want? What skill set do you want to utilize? You have to figure out those things before you can find a job that's satisfying to you. 
and that meets the goals that you set for yourself. And so I recently told someone because they were like, I don't have time. I work all day. You do what you want to do. If this matters to you, if having a new job matters to you, you'll set aside an hour a day to look up roles that align with what you want to do and set a goal to apply for them during the week because your mental health matters and being stuck in a role that you're unsatisfied in has a huge detriment to your mental health. And of course, bills have to be paid. So you can't just up and quit, but you have to be an active participant in your job search. That's true. I know. I mean, as someone who's in the working world, sometimes it can be challenging because job changes can take a really long time. It can just get drawn out over weeks or months. But I do think that it can just be empowering to take little steps, even if the solution doesn't present itself right away. It just feels good to get the ball moving sometimes. Absolutely. I completely agree. You have to do something to make a start. It won't start unless you make that first step. And I think many people think it'll just come to them. But job searching isn't easy, but having a plan in place makes it easier. Absolutely. And digging more into the job search process, Are there places where you see people getting stuck because they're afraid? Like, are there any steps in the process where people are having troubles, whether it's maybe their resume, selling themselves in an interview, putting themselves out there, networking? Like, where do you see people being a little bit afraid to move forward in the way that they want to? So there's two things. The first one is properly marketing yourself on your resume. People like to copy and paste the job description. And that's not what a resume is. What I often tell people to do is keep a running tab of the major things that you've done at work. So if you participated in a huge project, keep track of what you did. Add that accomplishment to your resume when the time comes. If you worked with 50 people to implement something, make sure you say you worked with 50 people to implement a multi-million dollar project. And the second one is often getting out of the rut of no. You're going to get no's. No's happen. But you can't start saying, I just can't do this. This just isn't going to work for me. You'll get a yes. You'll get interviews. If you're getting interviews, you'll know you're doing one thing right. Your resume is getting past the system and finally making it to a person who sees it. And it's easy to fix interview problems. If you have the skills, you made it that far. Absolutely. Hearing no can be discouraging, but I think that that's really good advice. And I think it's also helpful to know that it's a universal experience and that no's are pretty much part of, I think, most people's job search experience. And it's just kind of something that people have to power through. And I know that you've written on your website and some of your blog posts about your experiences and the experience that women of color have in the corporate space and specifically what can be challenging. Can you share a little bit about that and advice that you would give to someone listening to navigate some of that? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. One of the biggest things that I initially started, it's hard trying to navigate having black hair in a space that's not black hair-ish. Kind of going back to Toastmasters, I gave a speech called Don't Touch My Hair. And it's a corporate club, so it's only people who work at my company. And quite a few people were like, oh, I didn't know it wasn't okay to touch your hair. And in the corporate world, you kind of don't realize everybody's different. You don't realize that your hair doesn't determine professionalism. And one of the second things is finding a voice in a room full of people who don't look like you. There was this time where I was the only woman in the room, the only person of color in the room, and one of the managers, he curses a lot. And he every time he curses, he looks at me and says, I'm sorry. And so when I was like, are you apologizing because I'm a woman or what? And he turned bright red and he never said anything to that nature again. And I think the third thing is navigating that intentions come off differently as a woman of color. There have been many times where I'm like, okay, I need to tone down because I'll be perceived as the angry black woman in the room. When I've seen other coworkers or other cohorts, even at other companies, do the same thing, and it was praise. And navigating those microaggressions is tough. Navigating the world of you speak really well is rough. And you have to learn how to kind of explain that well, that was a weird thing for you to say without coming off and making them think that they need to be on the defensive. Have you found successful ways to do it? I mean, it's just 
you add on the fact that there's the power dynamic there, right? Because if the person who's doing that is your boss or someone in a position of power, have you been able to craft something in a way that feels like good in your heart, but also feels like the thing that you do want to say? Yeah. So I'm grateful that our company has one-on-ones all the time for you to talk directly to your management. And what I've discovered is not having these conversations in rooms with other team members, not having these conversations in the room with your manager's manager, sitting down and saying, hey, last week when you said that I needed to tone down, I don't think you realize that this is my personality and it's not just you. And you totally have to understand the differences in people's personalities. And I think that set. And then later I just sent him an article on what microaggressions were and he actually understood. And sometimes I think, especially depending on how your management is, if they are data focused people, sending the data behind it helps a lot. And so I definitely think those are things that have helped me and can absolutely help other people. I think sending an article makes so much sense. Also, like if an interesting article pops up, it it can also just be a general awareness building thing of like, oh, this is an interesting article. I think my team should read this. Yes, I have a manager who does that. She's also a woman of color and she sends out these articles that just seem interesting. And sometimes they kind of hit on some of those dynamics. Yeah, that's really helpful because it's a way to start building awareness and almost start preempting things and maybe stopping it from happening in the first place, which seems like an easier way, at least if someone feels afraid or intimidated, because it can be scary to speak up in that way. That can, I think, be one way to start out if someone's feeling like, oh my gosh, I can't imagine saying this to someone that feels really big and scary. Absolutely. And you learn at each time something happens, you continue to build on your knowledge base. For sure. And I want to ask you to share advice from the work that you do when it comes to things like salary negotiation, money, asking for more. It's something that a lot of women struggle with. I think we all have our own relationship to it. But I would love to hear just, you know, either your best advice on that or what you would really want women to know to help them feel empowered to ask for what they want and get paid their worth. So here's the thing. And people always talk about studies that show how much less women make than men. But what many people fail to realize is a lot of that is due to not asking. Every salary offer you've ever gotten has been negotiable. Every salary you've gotten could have been higher You had you asked for it. And I'm a strong advocate of not just going in and saying, I deserve $10,000 more than you're offering. Why? Go in with your list of reasons based on your experience, based on your education, based on the job, but also based on the area. If you've used, and these are the places I recommend, payscale.com, and Glassdoor.com are really good about giving salary recommendations based off of the job and the years of experience, as well as Mm salary.com. And so if you know you deserve more money, not even deserve, if you know that you put in the time for more money, ask for it in the interview. If you're trying to get a raise at work, go prepared with everything you've worked on that makes that salary increase worth it and say, here's what I've done. Here's the proof. Let's go to HR and talk about it. Why do you think it can feel so scary to do that? Because a lot of the times as women, we weren't raised or taught to ask for what we want. It's say thank you to what you're given and accept it. And we don't have to do that in everything in our life. If there's a time where you want something, nobody knows you want it. Nobody can give it to you unless you ask. It's so true. It's so interesting, too, because it's like asking and almost what you're saying, being open to receiving. I think sometimes, too, I've even noticed myself, if someone gives me something or does something really generous, it's like there's this instinct to like give it back, you know, or to kind of deflect it and being open to letting that come in and just saying thank you for things and like just letting all of that good stuff come in, I think is so important too. Yes, you have to. In order to not just be successful, but to be happy, you have to. Yeah, I agree. It can 
can be hard. I think it kind of goes against this very comfortable space to be in, which is like, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to be small. I'm going to sit in the corner. And then as soon as we get pushed out of that space, it's almost, it can feel triggering in a way. And you just want to kind of default right back to that. And so I think it's an untraining and an unlearning a lot of the time, but it's so important. And I don't know if this is something you've seen in people you work with, but once you start untraining that and kind of getting more comfortable, really showing up the way you want to show up, it feels amazing. It does. It's scary to get there, but it feels great. I like to use the analogy of people who go skydiving. I'm sure flying to the top of that a building or whatever you're flying up to and putting on the harness. And even the second you jump feels terrifying. But once you're free falling and you hit the ground and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that. Yeah. It's like, why didn't I do this sooner? <laughs> yes. Totally. Well, it's not even that different from skydiving, too, because I think it does activate some primal fear centers in our brain. So it's in terms of like physiological experience, it's not all that different from us thinking that we're about to die. And I think that's why certain situations can be so challenging. So you really are in some ways like trying to convince yourself to jump off a plane. So that's such a good example. (laughs) I love it. Yeah. I had a really shy, shy, shy client who negotiated a salary for the first time and they offered it to her and they were like, oh, I'm sorry. We should have offered this in the beginning. No, you didn't. But now you're realizing that you may not have me and you want to offer it. Salary ranges are always just that. It's a range. When you telling people what you want, don't give them a range. Tell them what you want. Yeah. A range is almost like a way of diluting it. It's like a way of like a little bit hiding because it feels less scary than just actually saying it. And it, yeah, it, it literally for me, it's just like a little moment of discomfort that you just got to like push through. Sometimes when I'm in situations that I know are going to be uncomfortable, I'm just like, okay, I'm getting my root canal. I'm going to get my root canal. I'm just going to get it and then it'll be done. (laughs) Yes. So versus saying I want 60 to $70,000, just tell them you want $68,000. Yes, totally. And then yeah, rule of thumb for negotiation is like whenever you give a range, what you're saying is I want the low end of the range. Like that's what's gonna get accounted for. But yeah, it can be so challenging for sure. Absolutely. Well, I want to move into one more question before we start moving into the next section. And I just wanted to ask you to give advice to anyone out there listening who is very talented, who has a lot of potential, but they're very self-critical and they're not really aware of their potential. And as a result, they're probably not operating at that full level of potential on a day-to-day basis. I would love to hear what you would want to advise to that person or share with them to just help them see everything that they have to offer and kind of motivate them to, like we were saying, like show up a little bigger or go skydiving and jump off the plane. (laughs) Yeah. So my first piece of advice is to write down everything that you're good at. Write down all of the projects you worked on, all the skills you have, and look at yourself on paper. Look at yourself on this paper and say, wow, I have the skills needed for the job I want. I just didn't know they existed. Once you've looked at it, put it on paper, it needs to be related in your resume. I tell people all the time, you have this skill that's listed on the job description. Go for it. And then the second thing is you can apply to that job that says 10 years of experience and you only have six. That's not stopping you from applying. Did you work in college? Did you internship? Those are years of experience. And oftentimes, if your resume tells this story, you don't need the full 10 years. It's often 10 years or. And then the third thing is to start speaking in public. Look for a local Toastmasters organization and get comfortable standing up, talking about who you are, what you're good at. Because if you can't relay your skills, a manager's not going to see them either. And I think finally, upskill yourself. Go and take classes. Go and get a certification. Upskill yourself to the point they can't tell you no. And then finally, definitely look for a coach that works with the things that you are looking for to work towards. So I work primarily with millennials, but there's coaches out there who work with managers who only work with executives. I have a great colleague who only works with people out in Silicon Valley. And it helps because 
coaches exist to help you find and see those things that you didn't even think about. Sometimes you need the mirror. And speaking of coaching, can you share a little bit about what you help with, what it's like to work with you, all of that good stuff? Yeah, so I do a a huge focus on resume writing. And what I've actually been doing lately, I work with my one-on-one coaching clients specifically on job development, career development. For example, I have a client and we work directly on creating a job search plan. The types of jobs you'll apply for, how often you'll apply for these, the skill sets that are required. And I have an open line of communication with all of my clients. So if you have a question at two o'clock in the afternoon, don't email me, text me and I can respond to it. We do a huge focus on interview prep, Because people are terrified of interviewing, but it also helps them prepare because I do mock interviews and those mock interviews help you see, oh, I talk really fast. Oh, I'm answering everything but their question. And so those have been really helpful to quite a lot of people. And then another thing that I do as a coach, I do tons of resumes, lots and lots. And the primary focus of those is a rebranding. A focus on the outcomes of the things you did or you've done and not just what you do. You don't just answer. I answer phone calls. I work with 200 clients a day on client negotiation and sales. It's completely different than I answer phone calls. And so those are definitely a majority of the things that I do on a day-to-day basis. That's so helpful. And it's kind of like what you were saying. Sometimes you just need someone to be the mirror or to help pull those things out that it can be hard for someone to see themselves. Yes, absolutely. I completely agree. And that, and I absolutely, I love it. I started um, because people would ask for career advice all the time. And finally I was like, I'm really good at this and people are getting jobs. Let's go and do it. Oh, that's so awesome. And if people want to reach out to you or find you, where is the best place to go? And I'll put it in the show notes as well. So the best place to find me is on Instagram or Facebook. And they're both Corporate Melanin Millennial. And CorporateMelaninMillennial.com is also a great place to reach me. Perfect. It must be very uplifting to work with you because I feel like job stuff can sometimes get heavy and it can just sometimes feel like really like serious and it is, but I think it's also good to have those good vibes, those positive feelings. Yes. So I have a coworker who comes by my desk whenever she's mad because she says it's like I have butterflies flying around my head because I'm always happy. And I write quotes on my manager's whiteboard. I switch it out every week and they're always like optimism and positivity quotes. And it's just because I'm a nerd and I'm always like this. <laughs> well, positive people, I think the research shows they get better results. So I think that it makes sense and I can feel it. So I really appreciate that. And with that, I'm going to ask you the closing questions, which I'm very excited to hear your answers to. The first is about the title of the show. And we've hit on this a little bit, but I'll ask you if you have anything else to share on this topic. But the show is called The Art of Speaking Up. And I love to have every guest share what that means to them or their thoughts or advice around the topic of speaking up? So the art of speaking up to me is to ask for what you want, reach out for exactly what you want and go for it. So for example, I got my first job straight out of college in I did the exact same thing for my graduate internship. Actually, I found the recruiter on LinkedIn and she didn't respond on LinkedIn. It was taking too long. So I uh, asked someone I knew who worked at the company. My sister-in-law had been there. She'd been retired, long retired. I was like, hey, how are y'all's email addresses set up? She told me. I sent the recruiter an email. Hey, my name is Nikki, last name. And these are the skills I have. I'm really interested in your company. I'd love to set up some time and talk with you. By the next day, she had set up a phone interview with me. And so to me, the art of speaking up means taking the initiative to say the things you mean and mean them. Take the initiative to take the step out and get the things you want, whether that's in your professional life, whether that's in your personal life. We don't always have to be meek and mild-mannered. It's okay to be bold and do the things you want, but you won't ever get them without speaking up. 
I love that so much. Just hearing you, your energy is infectious and it feels so empowering just to hear you walk through that. (laughs) I'm like this all the time. And the final question was inspired by my same inspiration for starting the show, which is that I went through a period in my career where I didn't really have mentors. I was feeling very overwhelmed, feeling very nervous, having trouble speaking up. And I started the show to speak to anyone who either might be in a difficult situation or is just looking to feel more empowered. And I love to share this space with the guests to just let them express whatever it is they would want someone who's in that space to hear and to know as they go about their day? So I had one that I just knew I was going to say, but what I think at this point in life is do the things that you're afraid of doing. Go out and apply for that supervisor position. Go out and get your license if you haven't. Go out and experience that place you've been saying for the last three months that you want to go to. My listener love has to be do the things you're afraid of now while you can do them so that in 40 years, you're not looking back. Oh, man, when I was 20 or 30 years old, I really wish I wouldn't have been afraid to go and do this job or I wouldn't have been afraid to go ride that roller coaster. Do them now and you won't regret it later. Oh, I love it. Your energy is so infectious. I'm smiling. (laughs) Thank you so much for doing the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for tuning in to my conversation with Nikki. I had so much fun talking with her. It was a super uplifting conversation. I'm going to put her Instagram handle and her information in the show notes in case you want to check her out. Thank you so much for listening to the show. It means so much to me. If you can think of someone who might benefit from the show or who might be struggling with some of the topics that are discussed on the show, please share it. People are finding the show because you're sharing it and I appreciate that and I appreciate you so much. I hope you're doing well. I will catch you next week with another interview. Actually, I'm being interviewed next week. So it's an episode where I was interviewed on another podcast and it's about self-confidence. So I hope that you enjoy that. And with that, I'm going to sign off and have a great day. Bye.